So as everybody can see my screen with a nice feather on it, amazing. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. I'm very excited to talk about the Philippine project and um, I'm always happy to talk about it because uh, I've been working on this, uh, on this program for quite some time now, <clears throat> since 2016. Um, and so my name is Daphne Kervas, as you can hear in French, uh, <clears throat> but I hope I won't mispronounce anything or I'll be quite clear on what I say. So it's protecting wildlife together in the Philippines that I'm going to talk to you today. So a little bit about me. Um, I am a conservation and higher education manager in the uh, field conservation and science department, which used to be the research department. So basically what we do is that in the remit of my job, I uh, lead a program in, the, in conservation. And I also manage some lecturers. And uh, I also handle a partnership with the University of Bristol. And uh, yeah, so that's a bits and bobs of all the work that I do. So I have quite a um, multi-responsibility kind of job and I love it. Um, I come from my background. So it's a picture of me actually in the Philippines here. And you can see how deforested it is, except on the background. But uh, so my background is I am an ethologist or someone who studies animal behavior. This is something I always um, really loved. And I, um, I was, uh, my speciality was on primates. And so I worked in uh, many places in the world, actually in three different continents. So I worked in uh, Costa Rica for a year, in Nigeria for six months, and two years in Indonesia for my PhD. Uh, so all of these were primates and uh, throughout my experience uh, doing fundamental science and my masters, my PhD, etc. I experienced a lot of conservation threats on the species I was studying, but also on the forest in general. Uh, I remember vividly actually a, a huge um, illegal logging uh, logged tree in Costa Rica with a sign on it, a dollar sign carved. So it was really freshly logged and it, the dollar sign was really a message to the people around that, you know, they use this to get money. So I decided to, then when I finished my PhD, I said to branch away a little bit from fundamental science and focus on applied conservation. And that's where I started my job at Bristol Zoological Society for like now 10 years almost. And, uh, and so now I'm just uh, leading conservation project uh, in the field on the ground, and as well as training the new generation of conservationists um, in Bristol, the students. I'm also part of the IUCN SSC. So that's, um, IUCN is the International Union for Conservation of Nature. So it's a big consortium that is um, global. And SSC is a species survival committee. So they are smaller groups that focus on different species. And so I'm a part of a, um, this committee on primate uh, protection and uh, specifically Southeast Asia. And I'm also part of this uh, species survival committee for pigeon and dove, <clears throat> uh, linked to the work that I do here. So that's about me. Now let's talk about <clears throat> what we do in the Philippines as a conservation charity. So our flagship species that has been um, for a very long time, this species is um, Negro spinning heart dove, or Gallicolomba kei. This is a species that is critically endangered uh, when people ask me how to describe this pigeon or dove, uh, I usually say it looks a lot like any pigeon you will see in the street, except it has this really dark red um, bleeding heart. Uh, and, and actually, it's um, whenever they call, it's kind of like inflate a little bit. So you see this red um, getting bigger. It's quite beautiful. Very shy species, very, very shy. Um, it's really hard to see it, even if you do spend, even if you're like, you know, a birder and you spend hours in the forest, this is a species that you need to hide and just um, not make any noise to see it. You need to do playbacks as well to be able to spot it somewhere. Um, it's ground dwelling, so it's interesting. It doesn't nest higher than a meter and a half from the ground. So very sensitive to uh, pests, well, you know, rats and such. Um, and yeah. Quite a, quite a sensitive species. Now that I'm not sure if I shared my screen and did audio, I hope so. So, oh yeah, share sound, it's gonna work. So I'm gonna play the call of a bleeding heart and give me a thumbs up.
Thank you. So this is a clear sound of the bleeding heart. You can hear the river in the background and the, the forest, but uh, this is one of the sound actually. This, this species is really not really studied much. Um, not many people know anything about the species. We know that there is two sounds. I've heard two calls, but one of them is only recorded. Um, yeah, so this is really, really important species. A species that is actually really good to attract funding. We also, so we work in this area. This area also has this beautiful hornbill, Visayan hornbill, <coughs> Penelopides panini, which is a, a species that nests in the tree. And when the female is um, with the, the babies, or chicks, sorry, and uh, is um, brooding, then the female close uh, the nest, uh, the, the hole of a tree, close it completely and leave just a tiny bit for the male to go and feed her and uh, the chicks whenever they hatched. So very important species as well, endangered. And we also work with the Vizian warty pig, and you might have seen those in uh, Bristol's gardens. And um, they are, yeah, so that's actually see Elvis uh, that you may know. The Vizian warty pig is critically endangered as well. Uh, there is a little bit more research done on them, but not too much either. It's uh, much easier to see them in captivity. So there's a few different zoos that have these species. Um, unfortunately, is uh, heavily hunted and the population is going down. So these are the three big species uh, that we work on in uh, the Philippines. And so the first question you may ask is, where are we working in the Philippines? And the Philippines is huge. It's a very, very big country. Uh, you have a picture here that you can see. And we focus our work on two islands uh, in the West Visayas. Visayas region is one region of the Philippines. And these two islands is one called Negros and the other one called Panay. Um, we have four different projects within these um, different islands and three main um, partners. So the first project, for example, is that we work on wildlife monitoring and protection. So trying to find out <coughs> where are the species, what are the type of habitats these species enjoy, and trying to protect it from any kind of threats. The second project is community alternative livelihoods. So trying to mitigate these threats is sometimes linked to um, trying to find alternative livelihoods or other ways to earn money than the potential threat. So if the threat is say hunting, then it would be providing a different option than hunting to gather uh, meat or um, to earn a living. Uh, if it's you know illegal logging, then it would be about maybe having um, Another, another way, like a different way of uh, doing agriculture that will be more sustainable, or it could be that you could uh, be more effective when you're burning wood and you have like different ovens and things. So that's community alternative livelihoods. Then we have reintroduction project where we are involved in actually reintroducing species from captivity into the wild. And finally, a captive breeding project we are a zoo, we have a lot of knowledge um, and a lot of, and we can support other zoos and captive breeding centers to um, increase their welfare, improve their husbandry techniques, etc. And so in terms of location specifically, the number one and two, so wildlife monitoring and protection and community alternative livelihood is on the Darwin project in the map, on the insert map. So the Darwin project and our main um, partner, Philincon, so the blue square, always, I should always explain the figure. <laughs> the blue squares are the partners. So you have Philincon, Telarac, and Centrop. And the red round are field site or place we work in. So the Darwin project and Philincon are our main um, site for working on wildlife monitoring and protection and for implementing community uh, alternative livelihoods. The third project, reintroduction project, is in the bottom on the left, on the right, no, left, sorry, <laughs> and it's with Talarac. So reintroduction project is about um, reintroducing, actually, the gross pinning heart into a reserve and trying to see how uh, this species fare. And the captive breeding is both in Talarac and Sanchop, uh, down into Maguete. Um, captive breeding is about trying to make sure that um, the two sites that hold uh, negro spinning heart are actually thriving. And these species, negro spinning heart doves, uh, were 
So for a very long time, there was only two places in the world they were keep, kept in captivity, Talarag and saint trope on the same island, right? Uh, now, Singapore Zoo has as well has this species, but that means that there's three places in the world where there's captive population of this species, and this species is critically endangered, so it's really going down in terms of the wild population. So it's really important for us to build this bond with this captive breeding center and help them build this population. And then you could ask me, why are we not talking about North Negros uh, on the top of, uh, right? It's because we are halted this project, but basically what we're doing there is wildlife monitoring and protection. But for now, we are like currently right now, we are not really working intensively in there because we need to spread our focus in the places that we can um, best do work. So we are quite busy right now with all these other projects. So we are put this North Negros on pause. Now, so I could talk to you and show you nice pictures and just blab my way away. I'm a lecturer, so I've done that. I can do that. But I think that there is nothing as much as a video sometimes to bring uh, the point across, but also to kind of give you a sense of what it is to work there. So this video, it's a documentary of about 40 minutes that is available on YouTube. I'm going to show you 15 minutes, uh, the first bit and a middle bit, uh, because there is two things that are relevant in this um, video. So the video I want to show you here is about the work that our ranger do uh, in one of our sites. And in there, you're gonna see how the site is, you're gonna see the type of species that uh, occur, but you're also gonna see the type of threats that we have to deal with. We've tested it just now, so there's no reason why it wouldn't work. I say that. Open it. Screen, hopefully. Can you hear? Oops. I always loved photographing and filming wildlife and nature. I knew I had to do something significant with the skills I have. I met Javi Barsinal, the head and founder of the Dulungandit project, when I was in Colasi Antique, out photographing birds. When he invited me to make a film about the Film Con Rangers, I said yes. I know I had to let the community know about these unsung heroes, these guardians of the forest. So the Philinkin Rangers are a 15-man team made up of locals from the Northwest Panay Peninsula Natural Park. They protect the park from poachers and some illegal workers or illegal man-made activities. Our journey started early. The Northwest Panay Peninsula Natural Park is located at the northwest section of Panay Island. The Northwest Panay Peninsula Natural Park has a total area of 12,009 hectares that comprises three municipalities in Aklan and two municipalities in Antique. It is home to Panay Island's most beautiful wildlife and forests. That is why it is very important to protect it because it is a victim of a lot of illegal activities. So, well, actually, to be honest, it's kind of tiring going up there, but everything was worth it seeing the rangers doing their job firsthand. It was really life-changing seeing them working, seeing how hard their work is. It's very fulfilling at the same time.
Pwede makaman? Okay, sa bawag ka This is actually epic. Crossing rivers, like National Geographic. <laughs> yeah. Tahu, kita pun ikut nama tahu, tahu. So their goal is to protect the Northwest Panay Peninsula Natural Park from illegal hunters, illegal loggers, and to protect or to conserve the natural park from degradation. So now I'm going to jump a little bit. <clears throat> In the um, documentary, it is freely available on YouTube, but I want to show you something about um, what happened actually when they shot the documentary. If it works. A normal person would probably say that their most thrilling experience was the view or the wildlife, but mine was different. There was a part where we were about to set camera traps on the spot where wild boars were seen. And um, the rangers asked me if I, if I wanted to follow them because they wanted to show me where the nests are. And so I said yes. And so we followed along. Uh, the ranger was showing me the tracks and uh, they were pointing out the leaves that the boars were eating. And that was it. We heard dogs I mean dogs why would there be a dog a few hundred kilometers away up top in the hills right so it was obvious there were hunters and it was at that moment I realized that yo you could probably not go home so they were preparing, they were calling for backup, and they were, you know, getting ready on how to arrest those because they were confirmed because they heard, we heard voices shouting along with dogs, and so there were probably little hunters up there. So they were getting ready, they had their knives with them, and I just hid with my camera. But 
I wasn't afraid, I was excited. Because that was, uh, you know, you, you think you only see those on TV, but to experience one of those in real life, that could be, you know, that's a once in a lifetime experience. So when the Rangers told me to get cover and go back to the camp, I said, no, I need to document this. I need to show what's really happening up here because this is why you guys exist. So I had to take the risk with the Rangers. And so we did the arrest. We charged towards the illegal hunters. So we were planning to set up capture them, six of them, with guns. They had 12 gauge shotguns, um, and then they also have those uh, airsoft guns, the ones that they use with, you know, pellets. I just saw how the rangers were serious about their job. One ranger told me that there's no justice up in the mountains, so you really have to be, you know, you really have to go against those people because if they pull the trigger first on you and you you'd never be found anymore, you, you won't exist, you'll just disappear because the, there's no justice in the mountains. So when we were able to wrap it up, catch the hunters, we went back to camp and we told the guys about it. So. That was the most thrilling part. Well, the good thing is we got you know, footage on the camera trap, so, yeah. So we went up the camp. 
that's it. Yeah. <clears throat> so I wanted to show you this video because I think it explains a bit better than. Oops. Uh, what did I do? Oh, I did. Yeah, it explains a little bit better in video rather than words the, the type of uh, things that the type of threats that we face, right? Um, illegal hunting, specifically here, more than um, illegal logging. It also shows a little bit the work that the ranger have to do, going to the forest, the rivers, climbing. Um, this is all fun to do when you go to this type of really like sharp landscape. And you also, you show the camera traps. This is the thing that we use to record wildlife because it's so hunted there that <clears throat> um, the, the wildlife will run away from you for good reason <laughs> as a human. So uh, we use camera trap, which is indirect and you can see really the type of footage that we get. Um, and, and also when you do, you know, encounter hunters then the type of reactions and interaction that happens here. Um, so yeah, that's why, and so you have the, the full documentary of 40 minutes if you want, but um, this is a little excerpt. <clears throat> so if I can change the slide. Yes, okay. So what, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit more specifically on um, the project. So we've just looked at the video on uh, from the ranger aspect. Um, but we also have a lot of different um, teams and communities that we work with. So we have a Darwin Initiative funding program, which is actually large funding that started in June 2022. It's about 322,000 pounds, but 95% uh, is going to the Philippines. So we are not keeping any money here in the UK. We are just uh, trying to make sure that the organization on the ground has the support the funding, the staff, and the training to be able to help um, protect this fantastic forest. And the forest you've seen now, it's just, uh, it's, it's beautiful and very special because it's a lowland forest, right? So whenever you go to places in the world, the first thing that gets cut down is um, lowland forest, forest that is easy to reach, right? This park is actually lowland forest and not be cut down because it's surrounded by mountains and because it's so hard to go over it through the rivers and the mountains that it's just a little hub, a little safeguard of species that do thrive in, in lower and not mountainous, mountainous landscape. So our Darwin project, uh, it's three years and it's the title is investigating hunting causes and implementing community-led mitigation in the Philippines. So as you've seen now, people are hunting. Uh, and so we have rangers to stop this illegal behavior. And we have a field team as well that is here to collect information on how much is there of pigs, how much is there of all this wildlife, these birds, and how is this population going? Is it going up? Is it going down? Is it the same? Uh, is there more illegal behavior or illegal hunting now, right after COVID, than it used to be in the past. So the ranger is helping us with that. But we also are understanding that, I mean, it's not enough to say you should not hunt illegally. Usually people that do hunt illegally is because they are driven to it. Um, so we have a community team that is working in eight different villages all around the protected area. And they go there and they're trying to understand why people are hunting. Maybe it's because of leisure. Some people enjoy hunting for leisure and that's completely fine. Maybe it's because they sell the meat in the market. It's a good amount of money. And so it's worth their time to go and sell the, money, the meat in the market and get some livelihood out of that. Or maybe it's just to feed yourself, right? And any of these reasons are in themselves, they're completely fine but the way you will try to mitigate those are very different, right? You're not gonna try to tell someone that it's not good to go illegal hunting when they're trying to feed their family and provide protein, right? So we are trying to just ask people, why do you think people hunt? And what can we do to try to, you know, slow this illegal hunting? Maybe is there some, any solution that we can help so for example, one solution we're thinking about is having pig farm, domestic pig farm. We will provide about 7,000 pounds to start a pig farm. So building the space, buying the saw, buying the insemination, the vet cost, 
having um, a, a space for the piglets, and then they can produce their own meat and they do not have to go uh, and hunt illegally, which will be more demanding than having domestic pig at home. So that's the work of the community team, trying to first find out why people are hunting and then trying to find a solution together, obviously. We're not here to dictate anything, but trying to find a solution together to uh, find other livelihood, other way of living um, that will not be uh, negative to the wildlife. And then we have a market team here, and you can see in the picture, it's a picture I took actually, <clears throat> of tusk, of uh, warty pigs. You have um, um, the spine colon, or like the vertebral, the vertebras of snakes, and you have also the skull of snakes and skull of monkeys. Uh, so these are trinkets that I have seen in a tourist shop. And so it's about finding out, so why do people buy it? Um, What's the rationale? What's the, is there a lot of people that are buying it or not? Yeah, maybe these are things that attract the eyes, but then the people are buying something else. You know, we're just trying to um, get some information, get some information as well on illegal meat. So is there people selling meat that have been um, from critically endangered species? Uh, is there restaurants serving illegal meat? And again, it's a bit of a discussion to start to collect some information and to try to find a way that will best mitigate this. So these are the four different teams we have within the Darwin project. And so specifically for the uh, field team and now the ranger, you've seen a little bit now about uh, the ranger work, but um, the wildlife survey is doing relentlessly very hard expeditions. So you've seen now how it is to walk in the forest, when it's pouring rain, it's even more harder. Uh, so they are going twice or three times a month uh, doing expedition and collecting all the time they see um, like uh, footprints of pigs and whenever they see hornbills or necro splitting hard dove or any kind of birds to try to measure a baseline of biodiversity for comparing from year one to our third year and to see whether we did have an impact with our project or not. Right, or if they was even worse. Um, this is it in order to monitor and evaluate how this project is doing so that in the future, someone else doesn't need to do this project again. We can use this project as a baseline to learn what is working and what is not working. Then we pay our rangers, of course, to um, undo traps. There's loads of traps, there's hunters, as you can see. Uh, there's also actually, uh, we found uh, an illegal construction in the forest. So they are dismantling this house that is used by hunters. And so that is not actually legally allowed to be built in the forest. Um, yeah, so that's the work of our uh, field team and team managers. Then our community team uh, is about um, working in the communities, as I said, and talking to the eight villages that we work with. And this is all done by Filipinos, right? So I am a project leader of this project, but I am remote. I'm here to support. Um, the key thing that I want is that people working within my project learn the methods and people working and living in these villages um, are talking to people that they know, that, that share their same, um, uh, you know, not tradition, but culture, they say the same citizenship, so they're all Filipinos, and, um, and it will be easier as well for people to open up and discuss. We're never asking whether someone is hunting or not, because it's an illegal behavior, and uh, it would be unethical to ask someone to, uh, you know, agree to something that is potentially will bring them to jail. So we're just asking about the perception of hunting. And so why do you think the people will be hunting? And why do, what do you think will be the best alternative livelihood for the people that are hunting? And so these are the hunting survey. Alongside that, we're also doing well-being and gender equality survey in order to measure again our impact. Are we, by our project, by the presence of our project, by our alternative livelihood, are we making life harder for the people in these villages? And that's the well-being information, or more unequal? based on gender than before. So like we measuring data in year one and me measuring data in year three and we comparing and seeing whether we have a negative impact, a positive impact or no impact at all in the well-being of the people we're working with. Again, this is really important to make sure that we can measure our impact and that we can 
potentially mitigate it if we do have a negative impact. So that's the community team, very busy. Um, and then the meat store, res restaurant and shop survey is the market team. We call it market team, but they are looking at meat store, restaurant and shop. And they are approaching uh, all these vendors and we, and we are asking them, uh, where does this produce, this little tusk, this tooth of monkeys, anything, where do they come from first? How much do they sell? Do they sell a lot well, or do they not sell very much? Um, so far, as we, as we have collected information from the ranger, there is an increase in illegal behavior. From the community team, it looks like most of the hunters are hunting for sustenance of their family or their friends. So it's not about selling in the market. It's not about leisure and enjoying going to hunt. It's about feeding themselves and feeding their families. And for the market team, we don't find much illegal meat being sold in market and restaurant. We sometimes find a restaurant chef that opens up and share a lot of information. And it happens sometimes that there is some illegal meat so, uh, served in restaurant, but it's, it seems very rare. Again, that could be because of the data sets, like maybe the people are not opening up, but that's, um, that's also in itself okay. This is the first time we do any of this research there and there's ever been done research about that uh, in this area. So that's the Darwin project. Uh, it's a large project, it's very big, but it's very exciting. And um, yeah, and so there's many different pathways and things linked to that. And I'm really happy to have any questions you have on that. Um, going on with other projects we have. So as I said, we are working with Captive, we are a zoo, and <laughs> we should never forget that. <laughs> and, uh, and so therefore we, are, we have a lot of knowledge on captive breeding. We also are a good mitigator. And so, for example, you can see in the picture on the left, uh, there's me in the middle with Jenny Poole, who is, a, I don't know if you know her, but she's a keeper in Wild Place uh, project. And we have two people with um, sunglasses. These are actually the two heads of the captive breeding center that had the Negro Spleening Heart. And before this specific meeting here, they met only once in the last 10 years. There was um, not too much trust between these two partners. And so because of our presence, Bristol Zoo, uh, Centrop and Telarac decided to sit around the same table and discuss. After a couple of years of doing that uh, several times, um, they accepted to exchange birds between the two captive breeding center. And that's a picture in the middle here where you have the two head keepers of both organization. And this is exchange. They brought some individuals from Centrop to bring to Telarac. And that's in itself was such a great win because that bolster the genetic variability of these two captive breeding, uh, captive breeding center. And on the right here, you have a picture of a chicks actually that was born a couple of weeks after they were transferred to Telarac. And in the bottom you have, of course, the logo of the people we work with. So as a mitigator, we can also have a great impact on that. And that's, that was really, really good. And since then, they are working together um, effectively. They are not much exchange because there's so much paperwork, but there is a, a dialogue that has been started. So that's really good. We are also working on reintroduction. And uh, so we have Toledo Zoo and Talarac Foundation that we are main two partners on this project in reintroduction. And I'm expecting a, a bit of PR coming up soon about that and um, from Toledo Zoo that we will piggyback on. And on the right, you can see the Necro Spleening Heart Dove. At, as it opened, it, uh, it has an interesting name. Uh, her name is Daphne. Yay! Um, not by chance, as someone ever asked me before, but because I'm involved in this project. Um, and she has a radio uh, telemeter on the back. You can't barely see it, but there is a little um, plastic thing coming out on the back. So uh, Daphne has been released in June last year and she's still alive and she, well, it's a good thing. <laughs> and she is still having the transmitter that works. And that's something that we never expected. She was with Joe, which unfortunately passed uh, within two weeks when he was released. She, she and Joe were the first Negro Spinner Heart of ever to be reintroduced in the world. And uh, because we have a teletransmitter, we are able to actually measure where she goes, the type of room range, which is very limited. And uh, the fact that she is able to she fed herself, she fed, fed, huh? she was able to feed herself straight away after 
she was released from the soft release area. And find food and protect herself against rats uh, by sleeping on a very thin branch. So that's great. There's another female as well. There's a pair that was released and the female made it, but not the male. I don't know. It's two data points. I can't make a trend yet. <laughs> but uh, we're continuing to, to introduce this species and it's quite exciting project uh, because it's never been done before. We didn't really know how to do it. We wanted to have teletransmitter. We couldn't have the GPS. You have a GPS on the left here and you have a teletransmitter on the top and you have a camera trap. The camera trap are very useful, but if you're trying to understand where an animal is, that's not going to give you this type of information. So we put the teletransmitter, we tried around the neck first, and the bird we tried it on, boom, just fell and couldn't lift their neck anymore, so that's not working. And we tried on the feather in the back, didn't work either because they couldn't fly. So the, the way we found it to be best is a backpack, a backpack around the, the wings on the top and the legs on the back. So the picture that you have on the right. And this is going very well as well. So yeah, if you have any questions about that, I'm always happy to answer. So going to um, the end of my talk, I see I've taken uh, 45 minutes. <laughs> um, what we're going to do in the next month is that we are going to actually, so we finished to do our, um, for Darwin Initiative project, we finished to uh, talk to people about hunting drivers or uh, hunting causes and understanding what are the cause of hunting. Now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, establish community consultancy where we're going to discuss with each community what is the type of alternative livelihood they will best prefer. And that's specifically to address um, why people will be hunting. So that's what we're going to do in the next uh, months, uh, starting actually in April. Then uh, we're also going to start a Rare Pride campaign. So Rare Pride campaign is a campaign that is organized about raising awareness and pride around one key species uh, in an area. And so we are going to uh, be present in festival and there's going to be also um, local singers singing songs about this, going to school, and, um, and festivals are really important actually in the Philippines. And so then, based on this rare pride campaign, we will be able to raise awareness about the plight of the species and also do survey about who are the people that, who are the type of people that buy these kind of trinkets that we saw with the bones. So are they foreigners? Are they local people? Are they, are they Filipino tourists um, or others? And just understanding how can we try to find best arguments against this, this type of, of, um, of, of trade. And then the GIS map on the, on the bottom is about understanding where do the visa and warty peaks spread themselves within the protected area? And where do the hunter spread themselves as well? And are they fluid in the movement they use? Are the pigs always avoiding? The hunters, are the hunters targeting the different specific area? Are the hunters preferring primary forest versus secondary forest, etc.? Or reachable, easily reachable, like a dry riverbed versus a more uh, sharp terrain. So that's in the next month. In the next year, we're going to expand the reintroduction, I hope, of a negro spinning heart. It's been so successful in this one space, but we hope by bolstering the captive population, we can release more Negro Spinning Heart in other places within uh, Negros Island and Panay Island. I would love to have a new protected area right next to the Northwest Panay. Um, just, it's gonna take a very long time, but just to have this new space being protected officially and continue to support the communities towards the transitioning towards something that is precarious and hard for them. Hunting is difficult because pig population is probably going down to something that is more sustainable and is more easier. So supporting community um, through this transition. And of course, all this work will not be able to be done by without the help of all my collaborators and fantastic people that I work with and all the partners. Um, probably my favorite bit in this project is protecting wildlife, but is also to work with fantastic people that um, care about uh, wildlife and that are uh, um, just really beautiful people in general, yeah. And that's it, thank you.
Oh, thank you so much, Daphne. That was so interesting. Um, I could definitely see a few questions popping up in the chat box. Um, so if you're OK for another 10 minutes, um, I'll try and whip through those quickly. Um, I'm just going to try and work out how to unmute myself permanently. Bear yeah, yeah, I was meaning that uh, usually I over talk, so I'm glad I didn't this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me just scroll up to the beginning. Uh, so there was a question about um, why via Sam, but it's to do with the name of the islands. Um, there was a question from Alex about, um, I think the volunteers are aware that we're going to have a new species at Wild Place soon, um, which is the spotted deer. Is that connected with this project? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. And that reminds me that I should put the picture in there as well. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, the Visayan, what the, uh, Visayan spotted deer is totally part of this project. It's a species that so partners and uh, there's a few pictures of people here that um, tell me that they're sure it is in the in the wild but I haven't seen videos like they saw they saw scat and they heard it but I haven't seen camera trap video footage so actually I think that the spotted deer is in much dire situation than the wartibig or the bleeding heart because I've seen both of these in camera traps but the spotted deer I mean it's it, it's probably some of them in the wild habitat, but it's really, really, really critically endangered and needs to be reviewed. Um, it's totally a part of this. I mean, obviously, you know, we use the negro spinning hot dove as an as an umbrella species to protect the forested area. But yeah, the vision of spotted deer is 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 I you know every time someone tell me like oh yeah I've seen the scatter like no show me videos show me picture I don't I don't believe you so yes totally and they are a part of the reintroduction project we had with a negro spinning heart so in the same area where we reintroduce Daphne and Lily we also reintroduce spotted deer and they're thriving very well as long as they are not hunted so I think the problem is that they are more sensitive to hunting than the pig because they are a bit less fast I guess. So yes, they are totally a part of this project and, and we are linking their presence to Wild Place Project to the Philippine program. Yeah, thank you for this question. Fantastic. Um, and there was another question, which I think was around the time you were talking about the alternative livelihoods um, and talking about potentially setting up a pig farm. Um, so the question was, how would the pigs in the proposed pig farm be fed? Yeah, so it sustainable, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a good question. So actually, uh, the first name in my main collaborator, Rhea, is actually also, so she's working for me in the Darwin project, but she's also a, a pig farmer. So that's great because we have all the know-how. And so she's buying feed. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's not sourced locally, the feed. It's just like uh, pellets, basically. So pig pellets. Uh, this, the price actually, actually increased since we started because of, you know, everything is increasing everywhere all over the world. But yeah, they're, they're fed by pellets, like uh, like cattle pellets, if that helps. So yeah, that's how they will be uh, fed. And they are being kept in really closed areas so that, you know, they are kept in this area. They are not going into the forest, et cetera, because that's also the worry about domestic versus mm. um, the and water pig. We don't know whether they will be interbreeding because people do have domestic pigs around there. And we haven't seen any worries that there will be interbreeding going on, but it's something we need to be, you know, careful of. So, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, and then we had a question about the um, the bleeding heart doves. I think when you were talking about um, Daphne surviving and then her, her partner, unfortunately, not surviving. Um, so there was a question about do the doves mate for life? So if the males don't survive, would the females then go on to find new mates? That's a great question. We don't know. We don't know nothing about this species. Um, there's one scientific paper published on them, uh, pre ours. <laughs> we published some as well, but there's that, there's just like nothing. There's this one paper that was published before is about someone spotting a nest and just following and looking at the nest for a couple of days. Um, this is not clear. So it's not even in captivity, it's clear at all. Um, so basically what the thing we had we know though, is that Daphne and Joe didn't breed before. So they were just put together in the soft release and then they were both released at the same time. So maybe they didn't like each other for some reason and Joe left, I'm not sure. Uh, or maybe Joe felt that there was another dominant male around the area and that's why he left. So he basically, Joe 
um, like covered one kilometer per day. It was really moving very quickly far away from the place where it was released. And, uh, and then we found this transmitter and we found a couple of feathers, but no um, carcass. So we don't sure how and by what it was predated as well. But yeah, we don't know. We don't know nothing about whether they're made for life or not. But that's a good question. Yeah. Thank she you. hasn't made it yet, so we're hoping. Um, another question about uh, dove reproduction, um, which was about in the captive breeding program. Do you happen to know um, whether they transfer the eggs of young pigeons and put them under foster parents, presumably to try and increase the number of um, individuals yes. they can have? Yeah, do know that. Yes, so for sure. Um, I mean, I, we, we have negro spinning heart of parents that are able to raise their own youngs, but we also do use foster parents. So I can't remember on the top of my head which species it is, but it's a species of, of pigeon as well. And uh, that is very relaxed about fostering, uh, about being a foster parent, that we use that a lot in captive breeding. Yes, totally. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Um, and then a question from Ella. Um, is it known whether the bleeding heart of the bleeding heart dove's plumage serves some sort of purpose? I was wondering if this was if this marking is part of displaying, as you said, it appears to expand when they call. It's a good question. We don't know that so much. Um, what we know is that both the female and the male look a lot alike. So you can't really tell which sex is which. We have to actually do a DNA test to find out. So to find out whether it's a female or a male. Um, so, but so like, you know, we, we, we see the same um, pattern on the chest for the females and the males. It could be that, it could be that it's a marking displaying something. We, so the two vocalization, we think that one of them is potentially made by males and the other one is potentially made by the female brooding. Again, that's not something that we know for sure. But this is, you know, I can totally try to get this information from the Lujin, um, the person on the middle, the Filipino on the middle, who is the one, I mean, I think he is the expert of Negros being out of in the world. Um, he's the keeper who spends so much time with them and is uh, very, very good at keeping them and very gentle. 